Get everyone seated, and we will begin the uh, Education Administration full committee. Civil Justice had a long committee, so we are running a few minutes behind. As we get started, make sure we have a quorum. Madam Clerk, uh, clerks, will y'all please call the roll? Representatives Baum, Bulso, Here. Butler, Sapicki, Fritz, Here. Gant, Here. Gillespie, Here. Haston, Here. Hurt, Here. Jones, Here. Lafferty, Love, Here. McKenzie, Here. Parkinson, Reagan, Here. Ritchie, Here. Stevens, Here. Warner, Vice Chairman Slater, Here. Chairman White. Here. Mr. Chairman, you have a quorum. Thank you very much. Members, as we begin, anyone have a recognition, personal privilege, announcement that you'd like to entertain before we begin? Seeing none. Chairman Reagan, may I let, ask you to lead us out in a prayer today, prayer for our K-12 and higher education students? I'm sorry, I said Chairman Chairman, it's a picky. I'm sorry, it's a picky. <laughs> Does it rhyme? I don't know. Prayer. Prayer. Yeah. Apologize. Okay. Let's bow our heads and go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we sit here representing the people of the great state of Tennessee, seven million Tennesseans. Lord, we sit here and we pray for wisdom. We pray that the Holy Spirit fills our mouths with the words that he wants out that are going to be discussed here. Lord, we pray for the men and women that defend us around the world, that allow us to sit here safely, knowing that we can have these discussions, Lord. We pray for their families that are missing their loved ones right now while they serve. We lift them up and we lift their families up. And Lord, we pray as education committee members that the children of Tennessee will become the new leaders of the next generations because of the educational system that we create, Lord. We ask this in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you very much. I hope that's not indicative of the two hours we're in here as far as keeping things focused. Okay, members, we're going, we have a full calendar uh, today. We're going to start out with our confirmations that we have from several universities and institutions of higher learning and we're going to start out, I'm going to call you by, by groups. The, these uh, uh, members will we be confirming on a consent calendar, but members without objection, I'm going to, I'm going to, hmm. yes, you may do that. Uh, without objection, members, I'm going to bump items five, six, and 10 from the consent calendar, and then we will come back after the consent calendar and, and, pull these items up. So we're now we're on items one and two, House Joint Resolution 97 and 98. I need a motion and a second. Thank you very much. We now have a motion and a second. So we'll have um, Mr. Michael Malley and Catherine, is it Kanata? Kanata? If y'all will come up, uh, this is confirmation for the University Board of Trustees for ETSU. I'm sorry, Austin P. It's going to be a challenging day. <laughs> I, w I was looking at Mr. Ramsey out there, and he's keeping me confused. <laughs> exactly. Okay, members, Austin P. State University Board of Trustees. We're going to start with, with uh, Mr. Malley. Would you uh, like to start out, just uh, identify yourself and give us about a minute introduction of who you are, and uh, you may begin. And just make sure your microphone's on. Thank you, is it on? I guess it's on. It's on. Thank you. Um, uh, my name is Mike O'Malley, and I live in Clarksville. Um, I'm a member of the Austin P. State University's Board of Trustees. Uh, was part of the inaugural uh, group and was the uh, inaugural chair of the board uh, for the first four years. Um, I'm a Wendy's franchisee and in the middle Tennessee and some other areas. Um, Proud to be a member of the Austin P. Board of Trustees. We have a great group. Um, it's been a terrific uh, group of citizens that uh, have Austin P. in their best interests. And not all of us, myself included, are graduates of the university, um, just supporters. And we are uh, uh, 
honored to be led by uh, Dr. Mike Lacari, who's with us today. And uh, one of the most rewarding things that we got to do in the first uh, four years of the board, we had the opportunity to uh, select a new president, which was a challenging uh, situation, but we came up with a, a great new president, Mike Lacari. So uh, I think that's plenty, and I'll let Catherine say hello. We now recognize Catherine Kanata, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, and then members, you, I will recognize you for asking questions after that. Thank you so much. My name is Catherine Kanata. I was born and raised in Clarksville, Tennessee. Went through the Tennessee public school system from first grade all the way through UT Knoxville. Where I played tennis in college. Went to Atlanta for nine years. Worked as a, a public accountant, CPA for Price Waterhouse and Arthur Anderson before coming back to Clarksville and working for our family business, which is an automotive dealership, Wyatt Johnson, for the last 22 years. And I've been on the Austin P board now for, it was close to six years. Maybe it's five years or six years. So um, anyway, Clarksville and Austin P is very important to me and our community, and I've enjoyed serving. Thank you. Thank you very much for those those introductions. And it is a wonderful part of our state. Uh, members, any questions or comments that you would like to uh, entertain of these our two guests from Austin P. Chairman Reagan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good day and thank you for being here. Uh, as you are probably well aware, our university systems have been uh, uh, the subject of a lot of controversy here lately in a few places. So my general questions uh, for you revolve around something called divisive concepts. Are you familiar with that? The general term divisive concept Yes, I don't know if you're referring to anything specific. I'm referring to the Tennessee Code, Title 49 bill that was passed last session. I'm not sure I'm familiar with it. Um, Mr. Chair, that's kind of important for the purposes of Board of Trustees because a Board of Trustees of any of our institutions are expected to ensure that these concepts that were uh, outlined by the General Assembly are uh, handled in the proper way in our higher education institutions. Uh, I have a parliamentary the, inquiry. Chairman, um, I think you may need to give more to the statute. I, I know these are sensitive topics, and you may be trying to avoid the name, but uh, you may have to give them a little more information. And uh, yes, sir, let me recognize Representative Powers. Um, Jones, Representative Jones. Go ahead. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I had a parliamentary inquiry. Um, if this, if... Um, is it appropriate for members to ask legislative questions of um, nominees for a position that is not here to make legislation, but who are over the purview of the the university's not day to day operations, as as what Representative Reagan is, is asking about, is questions of curriculum, questions of day to day operations. It just does not seem within the purview of um, what this should be about. So that was just my parliamentary inquiry. Thank you very much. Yes, and we've gone through this one several weeks with other board members. A question such as this, where you have a board of trustees which have the administrative or board duties over our U Tennessee universities, he is asking an appropriate question that concerns him. Now, he's not getting into specifics or, or personal character, so he can ask that question. Where we cannot go is if we get into a personal attacks on a person's uh, particular beliefs, and that's what he, but he is within his rights to bring up his con concerns on this particular issue, and then We'll go back and forth. Does that, does that help you? Parliamentary, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So a, um, a, a, an answer from a parliamentary standpoint could be uh, from this standpoint, I, I plan on complying with all of the a TCA code that which applies to higher education. Is that a question? Yes. Ask it one more time. I'm, I didn't really follow you on that. Thank you. Um, so I'm, I'm saying that to, uh, to, to, to that line of questioning, the a member at this level at the Board of Trustees could answer each and every one of those questions is I, I have every intention on, on complying with all of the uh, TCA codes that apply to higher education. That'd be fair. 
Okay. I s- Let's, excuse me one second. I'm sorry. Now let me, I've got two parliamentaries out of the way. Chairman Reagan, would you like to go ahead and ask? And then I think Ms. Kanata can, can respond. Mr. Chairman, based on the parliamentary inquiries, I would ask that we go out of session and hear from legal as they read the Title 49 uh, guidance on divisive concepts. You have that. Point of order, uh, point of order, Mr. Chair. Um, You're recognized, Representative Jones. I, th- I think all the members here can uh, read for themselves, and just for the sake of time to um, expedite this hearing, can we just poll the members? If anybody wants this read, if they need someone to read to them, we can have it read. But I think all of us have the intelligence to read for ourselves um, what this code was, and I just feel like this is grandstanding from my colleague um, from Oak Ridge, and I just hope that we can just expedite this. If there's okay. <laughs> Okay. Point of, point of order. One I second. Would... One second. I'm the chairman. I am over. I have heard your parliamentary inquiries. I'm overruling it. We're now back on Chairman Reagan. Chairman Reagan, respond. Go ahead with your questioning. You're not even on this committee, so... Mr. Chairman, the uh, people in front of us indicated they did not know the the appropriate uh, Title 49 for divisive concepts. So I would ask that we go out of session or remain out of session and have legal. Uh, uh, Inform them okay. of what they are so they can answer the question. With that, with that we are already out of session. So, uh, legal, will you respond? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Katie Robertson, Office of Legal Services, TCA Section 497-1902, defines divisive concepts as a concept that one race or sex is inherently superior or inferior to another race or sex, and the individual by virtue of the individual race or sex is inherently privileged, racist, sexist, or oppressive, whether consciously or subconsciously. An individual should be discriminated against or receive adverse treatment because of the individual's race or sex. An individual's moral character is determined by the individual's race or sex. An individual, by virtue of the individual's race or sex, bears responsibility for actions committed by the past by other members of the same race or sex. An individual should be dis- feel discomfort, guilt, anguish, or another form of psychological distress solely because of the individual's race or sex. A mediocrity uh, is inherently racist or sexist or designed by a particular race or sex to oppress another race or sex. The state or the United States is fundamentally or irredeemably racist or sexist, promotes or advocates the violent overthrow of the United States government, permits promotes division between or resentment of a race, sex, religion, creed, nonviolent political affiliation, social class, or class of people. Ascribes character traits, values, morals, or ethical codes, privileges, or beliefs to a race or sex or to an individual because of the individual's race or sex. The rule of law does not exist because but instead is a series of power relationships and struggles among racial or other groups. All Americans are not created equal and are not endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, including life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Government should deny to any person within the government's jurisdiction the equal protection of the law includes race or sex stereotyping or includes race or sex scapegoating. Thank you, legal. So, uh, Ms. Kanata, Mr. O'Malley, we passed a bill last year dealing with CRT. That's what he's getting at. Ms. Kanata, you're recognized. No, we're, we're out of session. You're recognized. Uh, thank you so much for clarifying the intent of the question. I certainly intend to comply with all laws, Tennessee state codes, moral and ethical um issues certainly agree to comply with all of that thank you for asking and, and i agree with Catherine. i'm uh, sorry i didn't understand the gist of the question i'm certainly familiar with the dei um, uh, tenets and believe in those as well and we we at austin p have a long history uh, having served on the board um, of honoring those uh, laws and commitments and that's the way we believe and, and operate Thank you. Chairman Reagan, you're still uh, recognized. Thank you. So let me let me get some points of clarity here. The DEI or diversity, equity and inclusion. Uh, Equity means 
basically the we're out of session. sameness of outcome as opposed to equality, which is the sameness of opportunity. DEI, its very name, has equity in it, and therefore it fits in the, the, the divisive concepts that you, you just heard. So are you saying that you're going to comply with DEI and ignore that law? You recognize Mr. O'Malley. Gentlemen, we've gone through this. I've overruled. You may, you may answer the question, sir. Mr. O'Malley. Uh, uh, I believe in fairness. Uh, I believe in merit. Um, and I believe everybody should have an opportunity for success. Um, and I'm not sure if I'm a answering your question. Um, I don't think it's an issue at our university, and I think we pay attention to it. Uh, we have an officer of DEI at the university slash Title IX, all in an effort to be fair in, in how employees and students are treated. Okay, thank you. Is that all you have? No, I have one other question, sir. Chairman Reagan, you recognize for one more question. By the way, sir, I have received complaints for your university, but the next question I have for you, uh, in Title 39, it's uh, our obscenity code. And again, some complaints have come my way relative to that. Basically, uh, there have been issues that have raised, been raised at a number of universities over the violations or potential violations, is a better way to say that, of uh, the obscenity standards in our state, specifically uh, in connection with another university hosting Sex Week and some other things like that. Uh, what is your position on that, sir? Mr. O'Malley or Ms. Kanata? I'm not sure what you're specifically asking me. Uh, what is my position on having a a week, a sex week? I, I, would, I, would not be in, I would not be in favor of that. The, the concept of obscenity being that which is unsuitable for certain age groups, given that you have certain members of your university, particularly freshman class that may be sure. underaged, uh, that kind of thing would be a, a violation of Title 39. So I'm asking for the university, you as a board of trustee member are going to be in charge of setting those standards and ensuring they're adhered to. So I'm, your, your position on that, sir? I think I would be supportive of having a, a position that is opposed to uh, obscenity in any form on the campus. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Chairman Morgan. Representative Parkinson. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, I'm, I'm trying to maintain my poker face up here. It's getting a little difficult. You know, you, you, both of you said that you would um, uh, stand by the law as to, you know, as outlined in Tennessee Code, right? So that covers every law. You said all, I know you said all laws, right? You, you, and all laws for you, right? So any question that you get that's regarding Tennessee Code, you've answered it under all the word all that means all of the laws of tennessee code right and so you know i appreciate you being here um you know i thank you for your willingness to serve you know um uh i was going to ask you how the campus is at east tennessee state university but <laughs> apparently you're from austin p right <laughs> right and uh and i'm just trying to lighten up the room yeah you know you know you you guys seem like great candidates i'm, I'm looking forward to you serving so thank you for offering yourself we truly appreciate you Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Representative Parson. Doesn't do you any good to make fun of the chairman, though. <laughs> any further questions of our two guests from Austin P? Uh, yes, sir. You're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just one question. Thank you all for your willingness to serve. I appreciate that. Serve the great state of Tennessee. And it's the same question I think I've asked most of the, the board member um, folks and is is it your intent to help make our Tennessee universities the very best in the nation by promoting the constitutions of the United States and Tennessee for the benefit of all Tennesseans? You Absolutely. That? Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, that's the last one on the list that asked. Thank you very much for sitting in the hot seat for a few minutes. Uh, you may sit back in your seat and then when we come at the end of the consent calendar, we will have our consent vote. So now, members, we're going to move to items three and four on the consent calendar. This is for confirmation to the Tennessee State, East Tennessee State University Board of Trustees. We have Mr. Ron Ramsey and we have Melissa Stiegel Jones, former Senator Ron Ramsey. Ms. Jones, you may want to sit in this other table and not get too close to this. 
in or another room. Yeah. Yeah. Before before I recognize you, Representative Parkinson, you have a you wanna be oh you wanna be first. Okay, okay. Okay, uh Why don't we start out with Miss Miss Jones? You recognize first. Uh, thank you for being here. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Melissa Stegall Jones. I am a partner with Blackburn Childers and Stegall. It's a CPA firm in East Tennessee and Western North Carolina. We have four offices. One is in Greenville, uh, Johnson City, Kingsport, and Boone, North Carolina. I was um, raised in Elizabethton, Tennessee. And I live, work, and play now in Johnson City, Tennessee. My blood runs blue and gold. I'm a buccaneer for life. Um, my dad was a first-generation college student straight out of, if anybody knows Shady Valley, Mountain City. You can't get further east in Tennessee than that. Um, and he went to ETSU. He drug me on campus at a young age to basketball games, football games, you name it. I was there. Um, I have a twin sister. She and I both attended East Tennessee State University. We both graduated with our accounting degrees at that time. Um, <clears throat> I now have a daughter who has graduated with two degrees at East Tennessee State University, a degree in accounting and a master's degree in cybersecurity management. Very proud of uh, my whole entire family. My sister has more education. She also got two more degrees and got her doctorate in nursing just recently. Um, I became, I actually was here, sat, stood before you two years ago to um, take an unexpired term. They quickly put me to work and made me the chair of the audit committee, being a CPA and a certified public accountant, and I'm also a certified internal controls auditor. My industries include governmental, actually. It's one of my industries that I spend a lot of time auditing. And I think that about sums it up maybe for me. Thank you, Ms. Jones. But and before I go to Senator, former Senator Ramsey, uh, ETSU President, uh, President Nolan, is he still in the room? I saw him walk in a moment ago. Would you stand up? Let's recognize the president of ETSU, Brian Nolan. <laughs> Thank you for your, your leadership. Now let's go to uh, our good friend, <laughs> old buddy, Senator Ron Ramsey. Uh, that, that's Governor Ramsey to you, Mr. Chairman. That's, that's, just kidding. Uh, just, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you take the highest rank, okay? There, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, I'm Ron Ramsey, uh, born and raised in Northeast Tennessee also. Uh, graduated from East Tennessee State University in 1978. Uh, but three years, two years later, I started my own business. I've been self-employed since I was 25 years old. I had a surveying business, and now I'm in a real estate and auction business uh, from ETSU. Uh, my family really runs blue and gold. Uh, my, my mother went to East Tennessee State University. My grandmother went to East Tennessee State University. All three of my daughters went to East Tennessee State University. I got countless nieces and nephews that have also gone to East Tennessee State University. Uh, when I got out of politics and started my own business, I got out of uh, school and started my own business in a, in a weak moment. I got into politics. Um, in 1992, I ran for the State House, served four years in the State House from 92 to 96. Then in 96, ran for the state Senate. And then on, on uh, January the 11th at 1236 p.m., I became the first Republican lieutenant governor in 140 years, okay? And I served 10 years as lieutenant governor. This is my second term uh, on the board of trustees. I will be perfectly honest. I went with Dr. Nolan met with him at breakfast about two months ago, thinking I wasn't going to do this again, to be perfectly honest. But I told him that flattery will get you everywhere. And he <laughs> told me that you know, we need your, your ideas and your wealth of knowledge and all that. And I left Bob Evans as agreeing to do this again. So, so here I am and, uh, looking forward to this. Once again, I'm, I'm proud of East Tennessee state university. I think we're moving everything in the right direction. Uh, we're going well. And so I hopefully we'll have your vote to be reconfirmed. So you, you can tell I've been in politics. You don't do anything if you don't ask for the vote at the end. Okay. Did so, you ask for I'll, I'll ask for yours too. Okay. Bless the two. Okay. So I guess that about sums it up for me. And good to see all you all. I, I, people ask me all the time. I had a ball walking up and down the hall saying hello to everybody. Uh, they I, they ask me, you miss it? I don't miss being here at all. <laughs> I, I, I now have seven grandkids. Uh, this time next week, all 14 of us will be at Disney World. 
I told my wife two things. I did not want to be in charge of anything. I'll follow along behind you and do whatever you're doing. And the second and most importantly, don't tell me what this is costing me because I don't want to know. <laughs> okay. So I don't miss the, the, the process, but I miss you all. I mean, I walked in and saw Representative Parkinson. I just gave him a big hug. I, I miss you all. I do. I, uh, and Harold Love, of course, I served with his dad in the state house. Just good, good, good people. And I'll say this, that I'm going on a little bit, but people don't understand out here in the real world what it takes to serve in the state legislature. And and for, for the overwhelmingly most part, everybody's good, good, good people that are here for the right reasons. We may not agree on everything, but I like to think that, that when I was here, I, I treated everybody with respect, treated everybody with dignity, and it, because whether I agreed with you or not, you're still my friend. And thank you very much. Thank you, Governor, former Senator <laughs> Ramsey. We, we and we and we do miss you. We do. Miss you, you, uh, you. You're a breath of fresh air to us, uh, members. Uh, I have Representative Parkinson. Uh, and before oh. you begin, sir, the chairman will determine what is appropriate questioning. So we've gone through that. So let that be, and I will determine if your question is appropriate. Representative Parkinson. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You didn't have to throw the first lick. Uh, you know, I, I, I was simply going to ask, first of all, Speaker, all, man, always good to I'm see you. I'm telling you, man. man I, mean, I miss it. you. Always good to see you. Always good to see you. You know, I used to walk down the hall and call him the boot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I've got him on now. Right, right, right. But good to see you. So, so this question is for both of you. Um, um, is it your intent to abide by all of the laws of the state of Tennessee around any law that the state of Tennessee has passed as, as uh, persons in those positions on that board? Absolutely. I'll go first. Absolutely. I mean, I've taken an oath about 10 times, I suppose, that I would uphold the Constitution of the state of Tennessee and the United States. And I may not be elected official anymore, but I have every intent to continue to do that. Thank you. Thank you. And I appreciate you. Thank you for your uh, willingness to serve. Thank you. Truly appreciate you. And look forward to you all being um, put into those positions. I think I do. Too. You got my vote. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Love. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And this would be for both uh, persons also. Thank you, Senator Governor, for being here. Thank you also. I recall when we transitioned from TBR and UT systems to the, the Focus Act and these LGIs. I often wonder uh, what your experience has been like. What has been the most rewarding thing that you have experienced as a as the the, the first board members, really, of your institution mm -hmm. in, in its history? I'll just tell you, I look back on that and wonder how we survived before, to be perfectly honest. When we had one representative from each congressional district that governed every state, every higher education. Uh, uh, in the whole state of Tennessee where we had these local local boards. And, and then we all know that whether you're representing Memphis, representing Nashville, representing Bluntville, Tennessee, it isn't always the same. And East Tennessee State may not have the same interest as Middle Tennessee State, the same interest as, as Tennessee State, for that matter. And I think it's really good that we have these independent boards that can make decisions really much more quickly than the old board of regents used to be able to when something does come up. We do face problems. We do. But we can have a call meeting in, in three days or whatever the code allows us to do. And I, I think, I don't see honestly what took us so, so long to get to where we are now. And we know our communities. We're in our communities. Mm -hmm. We're there. We can hear um, and, and much more nimble on our feet. Thank you all. Thank you, Chairman. Representative Fritz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you all again for your <laughs> willingness to serve. I'll ask my question, even though uh, uh, Mr. Parkson kind of took it, and I appreciate that. And uh, you're a great <laughs> part of the state. I had the great opportunity to speak at your university a time or two when I was at Nuclear Fuels. What a great place oh, yeah. Northeast Tennessee is. So is it your intent to help make our Tennessee universities very best in the nation by promoting the constitutions of the U.S. and, and, and Tennessee uh, for the benefit of all Tennesseans? Absolutely. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Representative Jones, you're recognized, sir. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Um, it's good to see you all, and uh, congratulations on your nomination. My question is for Mr. Uh, Ramsey. Mm -hmm. I know that there's a certain uh, aspect of politics when you serve as lieutenant governor, and sometimes we say things that um, may be politically expedient, I guess I would say, but I just want, I have some questions about some comments you've made and, and how it will 
impact your decision to make an inclusive community for all students. Mm -hmm. um, during your time as lieutenant governor, you referred to Islam as a cult. Mm -hmm. In 2015, after a mass shooting at a college campus, um, you stated that, quote, fellow Christians who are serious about their faith to think, need to think about getting a handgun carry permit. Mm -hmm. um, these type of comments are, are very inflammatory, to say the least. And there's many of them, but I'll just start with those. With your comments, with your history, how are we going to make sure that you are creating a university environment that's welcoming for all students of all faiths, of all backgrounds? How are you going to um, make sure that that happens? I will say when I was lieutenant governor, I was pretty outspoken, but I meant everything I said when I when I did that then. I, 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 we didn't serve together, but I think anybody here that did serve with me knows that I am uh, very open. I can, you could come and see me anytime, talk to me about anything. And so I... Uh, um, just have to take it, take my word for it, I suppose, that I do treat everybody with honesty, I do treat everybody with respect, I treat everybody with dignity, and therefore, when the, any kind of those types of issues come up, I will be able to handle those. You may follow up with a question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Describing a whole religious group as a cult is respectful, in your, in your opinion? All members of the is Islamic faith. I didn't say that. I did not say that. I did not. I said there are some members, if you'll read that clo closely. And, and there were at that time some very controversial things going on. This was actually, as I say, when I, was, I guess it was, that's probably 2009 or 10. Do you have the date of that quote? But it, it doesn't matter. But but no, I, I've never said that, to be perfectly honest. If you're taking that out of context, you're saying that. I said that there may be some who are, end quote. Which is your last question? Lieutenant Governor Ramsey, how, with this history, with what's happening in this body, um, ETSU is a diverse campus. Mm -hmm. How are you going to ensure that every student feels welcome and included and affirmed in your position as a board of trustee member? By treating them welcome, that welcome people and and inclusive at that time. I don't think there'll be any problem with that whatsoever. And you could ask anybody at East Tennessee State University, and I think they'll tell you the same thing. Thank you. Thank you. Let's go to Chairman Reagan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You've heard the question that I asked before. You've heard the mm -hmm. reading that was done. And I will tell you that your university was a source of complaints that I have received in that area. Uh, as a matter of fact, it took a letter from my position as chair of government operations to get full compliance with a court order and law. So the question before you is, are you now going to make sure that the board of trustees ensures that the divisive concepts law that was passed by this general assembly is in fact employed and in to the exclusion of DEI, which is not in law anywhere. Absolutely. We'll follow all the laws that they're written, Representative Reagan. Absolutely. And believe me, I got the same complaints you did about some of this. And and I will say this. Lots of times there are complaints out there, but I always ask them for specifics. Please call me and tell me exactly which class of this came to, who was the professor that, that said that. And nine times out of ten, I never hear back from them. I'm not going to say that it doesn't happen because it does happen, but I always ask, give me the specific. And they say, we'll get back to you almost to a T. They don't. I'm just being honest with you. But I'm obviously, I'm still going to be willing to follow the law as written. To the, to the Ms. Jones? Judge. Yes, um, I will follow the law. Um, as a matter of fact, oh, can you hear me? Yeah, is your mic on? It is on. Is it on? Can you hear me now? Good. Can you hear me now? We got you. There we go. We got Am I you. close enough? <laughs> um, yes. Um, I was aware of the of the new legislation. It's actually posted on our website um, and a link to it and a description. Um, so, but it is it is our intent as ETSU trustees to follow the law and to follow that law. Thank you. F one follow up. You may have a follow up, Chairman Reagan. Uh, again, I want to emphasize that that law is in opposition to the DEI concept that was put forward. So as a board of trustees, you're going to have to balance that. You're willing I, to do that. I understand. Thank yes. you. Thank you. That was the last. Uh, uh, Chairman Lafford, do you have a comment? You're recognized. Thank you, Chairman. And through these hearing processes that we've been undergoing, I have started to ask myself if there's a little bit of a disconnect uh, between the governing body that you all serve on and will be serving on 
and then the institution that you are responsible for the governance of. Uh, I, I should back up. Thank you all for being willing to do this. This is not an easy task. So thank you. Uh, my question, do you feel like the board has a firm grasp on the day-to-day -day proceedings going on on our campuses, particularly given the question about the DEI? It's kind of the cousin to CRT, which there is the law on the books uh, to address. I've already, I'd like I've your already, thoughts on uh, that. One second. One second. Raise your hand, and I will recognize you. Representative McKenzie, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I, we are confusing two distinctly different statements. DEI is being blended and mushed in with divisive concept. The statement was actually made that equity means divisive. That statement was just made. That is patently false by the reading of the TCA that, 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 that was just requested. Okay, sir. Is that your comment? That is, uh, okay. am I correct on that, Mr. We, Chair? We can debate the meaning at a later date. The represent, the chairman is within his rights, just like the, the other uh, representative from, from, uh, from Davidson County asked his questions. So he's expressing a concern that he has. As long as we express a concern, we're not in here to debate the right or wrong or what uh, uh, the meaning of what a term is. Uh, Representative Lafferty, you're recognized. You may, you may finish. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, so basically, I guess the question is, from what I've observed going through these hearings this year, we seem to hear one thing from the, uh, the boards, and then I'm seeing another thing on the ground at the university level. Uh, could you address that? I've, I've, sir, you have a reputation for, for a, carrying a hammer uh, <laughs> that uh, sometimes you're not afraid to use it. And uh, I'm just, I'm curious. Do, well, will I, you give me a specific on where we as a board are out of touch? Uh, it's, I need a specific once again. Okay. So procedurally speaking, I'm told that DEI uh, is not something that is regularly carried out or practiced, but yet it's, you're told by whom, if you don't care, tell me that I, I, I will not disclose that right now. Well, there we go again. Okay. Thank you, sir. <laughs> no further questions. Okay. Let's move on. We have representative Warner. You recognize. Thank you, Senator Ramsey for being here today. Uh, yesterday I presented a bill in committee, uh, which basically would have allowed college students with an enhanced gun carrying permit to carry on campus. Mm -hmm. I had a member from the University of Tennessee, uh, I guess they sent someone down there and he spoke out against, and one of his comments or one of the things that he mentioned uh, when he was testifying against my bill yesterday was that uh, faculty and administrators could carry on campus, but students uh, could not. I had two young ladies that had testified, one of them had witnessed uh, or was on campus at UT Martin when a terrible rape went on. Another young lady that uh, had uh, had some issues, uh, maybe at MTSU. Give me your thoughts on on what he said about faculty and staff being able to protect herself, but not the students. I think I think if you're going to carry a permit holder, it may not sit well with everybody else on our board. I don't know, but I have no problem with that. To be perfectly honest, in 1997, I carry the gun carry permit law that we have now in the state of Tennessee. I was the one that sponsored that in the Senate. I remember at that time, you would have thought the world was coming to an end, that we're going to have shootouts and stop signs, and people going to fight over a loaf of bread in a grocery store and kill each other. We ended up, when, at that time, when I got out, we were had 400,000 people in the state of Tennessee had a gun carry permit. I used to give little speeches to be sitting in a room. I said, if the whole population was as responsible as the gun carry permit holders, this room we're standing in right now could be our state prison. So if you have, you go through the, the background checks, the credit, all the checks that you go through, as a matter of fact, we'll, we'll just keep going with that just a tad. When we had the, the one about um, the what they call the guns in parking lots bill, which, by the way, has caused zero problems, and that a, a friend of mine didn't like it. I said, what if we make them go through a background check, a TBI background check, a federal background check, take a take a class to prove they're proficient with a firearm, things like that. Would you be okay with it then? They said, oh, yeah, I would. They, well, that's what we're talking about here. 
if you have a, a valid gun carry permit, yes, that's what you have. But you obviously have to be 21 years old, too. So most most kids on campus still could not because, you know, to your senior probably. If you go through the process of a background check, all the checks you have to go through to get a gun carry permit, I have no problem with that. Thank you, sir. Thank you. One last question, then we're going to move on. Uh, Representative Jones, you had a follow-up question. I recognize you. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Um, members of the board, I, I want to get your reaction to an incident that happened at ETSU that was um, recently in court a couple years ago um, where African-American students had a rally about police violence and a white student, um, I'll leave his name off the record, um, showed up barefoot, wore a white t-shirt, overalls, and a gorilla mask, and carried a burlap sack emblazoned with a Confederate flag and marijuana leaf, rope, and bananas um, to taunt these African-American students. Um, are you familiar with this incident? Oh, yeah. And, and what do you believe can be done to address that type of culture? And how do we make lock that him up forever? I don't think anybody agrees with that. That, that. That's appalling. It should never have happened. And it's it embarrassing to people, not only at ETSU, but for Northeast Tennessee in general. Because let me assure you, that is not representative of people. That's one nut that happened to be out there. Do you Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, thank you all so very much uh, for uh, being here today and putting yourselves out where – uh, to serve the state of Tennessee. Uh, if y'all have a seat back in the audience, and I'm going to call up item number seven on our consent calendar, HGR 106. This is uh, my alma mater, University of Memphis, where Mr. David McKinney Welcome. Mr. McKinney is a good friend of mine back home, uh, works with AutoZone, and uh, I got two people wanting to represent Parkinson. I go to represent Gillespie. Uh, yeah, let, let me let him speak, uh, and then y'all jump in there. Mr. McKinney, you're recognized. All right. Yeah. Even as a lawyer, I appreciate a hot bench. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Feels like home. Um, first, I'd, I'd start by by thanking the governor, um, all members of the General Assembly, and the House Education Committee for. For, for having me before you today. Just briefly, uh, a proud native Memphian, second generation Memphis Tiger. Both of my parents graduated from the University of Memphis, technically Memphis State, if you're counting time, go Tigers. Um, both of my sisters graduated from the University of Memphis. Currently I serve as Vice President of Human Resources and Public Affairs for AutoZone, uh, have remained active in the business and civic communities, um, serve, uh, as vice chair of the Tennessee Retailers Association, locally on the the board of trust, the board of directors for the the Orpheum Theater Group and in the YMCA, have had a long relationship with the University of Memphis since graduating from there, the Fogelman College of Business and Economics, and also the Cecil C. Humphrey School of Law. Previously served on the University of Memphis Law School Alumni Board, and even prior to being nominated for the board of trustees, served on the University of Memphis Capital Campaign. Committee. I suspect as a trustee, I'm still on the capital campaign committee for the University of Memphis. Certainly last but not least, my wife, Shana, who is here with me today, I met at the University of Memphis. She is also a tiger. We have a son, age five, who, yes, is at the University of Memphis, not college, but campus school, campus elementary. So we are tiger through and through. Please be here today and happy to entertain any comments and questions. Thank you very much. Appreciate you being here and giving of your time and dedication to our community. Yes, it is Memphis State for so many of us. Uh, Absolutely. Hard to get to the university. Representative Parkinson, I'll go to you first. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and you know, y'all go as hard as you want on this guy right here. You know, no, I'm, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, it's the first, local love. <laughs> right, 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 right. First, first and foremost, thank you. Thank you. I couldn't think of a better person, you know, to be sitting in this position. So, but I do have a, a question that I need to ask you. Um, will you abide by all of the laws of the state of Tennessee written in the code in, the, in your position? Absolutely, yes. That's all the laws, like all of them? All. Okay, thank you, sir. Thank, thank you, you, man. Appreciate thank you, you so appreciate much. Appreciate you offering yourself. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ribson Gillespie. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. David, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, um, Representative. This, uh, I just, you know, then this doesn't just go to the University of Memphis board, but all all boards. These are these are non-paying jobs, and these are very dedicated people um, that are sharing their love and their skills and their resources to help with that. Um, 
So I, I do want to just put that out there on the record first, and thank you for all for being here. But um, thank you, David, for continuing to serve. Uh, you're a staple of our community. Um, I would respectfully ask for the powers that be to not let you get off the capital campaign committee. Um, <laughs> so uh, I'm going to go ahead and put that out there too. But uh, thank you so much for being here, and uh, you have my full support. Absolutely. I have a vested interest in the success of our great university. Thank you, uh, Chairman Sapiki. Th thank you, Mr. Chairman. Very, very simple question for you. You'll be in a position of great influence over your university and, and the young adults that are there <coughs> and the university school that you have that is very outstanding thank uh, you. with those. How are you going to use your position to help influence those lives, not only of your students, but future Tigers that, that are coming to the university? <sighs> Outside of having a fiduciary responsibility to the university and public public trust and duty of care, um, there, there, within that does come, in my opinion, a duty to emulate the congruency of the values that the University of Memphis has, not within just the four walls of the University of Memphis, but in the broader community. Um, and every day, I have and will continue to endeavor to do so. Um, selfishly, as I mentioned earlier, I've got a five-year-old son. I certainly don't always do the right thing, but to the best of my ability, try. And I think that that's an admirable uh, ambition for all of us here, whether we're on this side of the, the bench or the other side, to do so. And I don't take that duty and responsibility that I have as a trustee for granted. Follow-up? Very good answer. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have one last on the list, uh, Representative Fritz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you again, sir, for your willingness to serve. And I so appreciate that uh, that passion you spoke with. Thank, Thank you. you. Same same basic question, and I'll have one follow-up to this one for you. Is it your intent to help make uh, Tennessee University's very best in the nation uh, by promoting the Constitution of the United States and Tennessee uh, for the benefit of all Tennesseans? With every fiber in my body, yes. And, and my follow-up question, Mr. Chairman, just is, some of those great things, that, like your your university school, that you're doing in Memphis, how can we uh, help spread that kind of goodness across the state? What wow. are your ideas? This was not a plant. This this question was not a plant. Um, certainly, I, I I think that there is a a certain inherent dichotomy between perception and reality when it comes to 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 my community and and really others. But I'll just just speak to the community at large. Memphis has so much to offer, not just to the community, to the state, to the nation. And, and we can do collectively more together than we can apart. Memphis is a proud part of the state of Tennessee. And the more we embrace it, the better it is for all of us. Um, I am one that always is grounded in facts as opposed to innuendo and speculation. And the more that we do that, the more we see that we are Tennessee collectively, regardless of what corner or neighborhood you may claim. Thank you, and thank you, members, for your questions. Chairman Reagan, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I'm not going to ask you the same question because I never received any complaints from the University of Memphis. So good thank on you. you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, and, Representative Reagan. And I can also attest to the character of Mr. McKinney. I've known him for, for a long time, his work with all his own and everything he does in Memphis, and kudos. And since it was brought up by Representative Sapicki, the campus school, kudos. Top-notch, uh, blue ribbon. Director Sally Parrish do an excellent job down there, which is a model for uh, all communities. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. You may take a seat back in the audience. We're now going to go to item number eight, House Joint Resolution 109. This is the uh, University of Tennessee Health Science Center, which is located in, in, our, in Memphis. And this is uh, Natalie Tate. And so uh, you may seat have a seat, um, introduce yourself, and then I will go to uh, any questions, Representative Parkinson. You may begin. Okay. Test it. How about now? There you go. There we go. Good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity to be here today. My name is Natalie Tate. I am a Tennessee native, a lifelong Tennessean. I am a product of 
public education K through 12 and have attended three of our state uh, higher institutions for education. So really appreciate the opportunity to be here today. I have served on the University of Tennessee Health Science Center Advisory Board, was part of the inaugural board for that, and this would be my second term. I am a graduate of the University of Tennessee College of Pharmacy in Memphis uh, 20 years ago, but don't tell anyone that. And uh, very, very proud of the university, very proud to serve. Look forward to the opportunity of serving again, uh, if you would see so, and appreciate the time to be here today and happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Uh, Representative Parsons, you had your hand up first. Go ahead. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm learning the system in here. Um, you know, thank you for your for your willingness to serve um we love ut health science center in, in memphis we we it's a, it's a jewel for us and and you know when you see uh uh ken brown you tell them tell them we're sending all our love from from okay. nashville we truly appreciate you all so i got a question for you a very unique question will you abide by all of the laws i mean all of them that are listed in tennessee code annotated book as uh, a position on this board yes sir i will Thank you for that. That's all of them? All the laws? Yes, sir. I will. Uh, okay. Thank you so much. Thank appreciate you. you. Thanks Thanks for serving. Thank you. Thank you. And I appreciate your service on the uh, University of Tennessee Health Science Board. I always say I was talking to President Board the other day, as well as a new chancellor down there. And that health science center in, in uh, Shelby County Memphis is such a gem. Mm -hmm. But we can do even a lot more because it does provide such great services for our entire state. So thank you for your willingness to to serve. Representative Fritz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, ma'am, for your willingness to serve. Same same uh, uh, question. Is your intent to help make our Tennessee universities the very best in the nation by promoting the constitutions of the United States and Tennessee for the benefit of all us Tennesseans? Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Ms. Tate. Uh, that was all the questions. So if you uh, have a seat and then we'll go bring up, we just got a couple more on our consent calendar. Item number nine, committee, HJR 155. This is for confirmation for the University of Tennessee at Martin advis Advisory Board, and that's Hal Bynum. Mr. Bynum, you may, uh, you may have a seat and introduce yourself and begin. Good morning, or good afternoon. Mm -hmm. I've been here quite a while. Mm -hmm. uh, my name's Hal Bynum, I I'm a Martin resident and I'm the weekly county representative to the UTM advisory board. Uh, I'm here for reappointment, and uh, I was on the uh, inaugural board in uh, 2018. Uh, my wife and I are longtime residents of, uh, of weekly county, and uh, we share five children and seven grandchildren, and uh, four of our five children are UT Martin graduates. Uh, and, and two of my, uh, one son-in-law and one daughter-in-law are graduates also. So we've got a lot of ties to UT Martin and it's important to us and uh, as a family and it's uh, even more important to us as a community anchor. And uh, I, I am extremely happy to have the opportunity to serve and we'll try to do that in whatever capacity that you deem me to. Uh, I will add one caveat that uh, that I don't think's come up in any of these proceedings before, but I am also a student at UT Martin. I, I took a short 40-year break from my college career in 1981, and after serving a couple years on this board, I decided, you know, I should go back and finish that. And uh, and if I survive this semester and one class in the fall, I will graduate from that institution with great pride about a week before my 64th birthday. Thank you for letting me be here. Thank you very much. In relation to Mayor Jake Bynum? I am his father. You are. Oh, wow. You've done a wonderful job. He's a great man. Thank you. He's, yeah. uh, he was pretty good material to work with. Yeah, he was. Yeah, we really, really appreciate Mayor Bynum. Uh, so, Representative Parkinson, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and you know, I'm going to be pretty hard on you, so brace yourself. Um, first, thank you for your willingness to serve. Truly appreciate you offering yourself. I got a hard question for you. Will you abide by all of the laws inside of Tennessee Code annotated in that position that you serve in? Yes, sir, I will. 
all of the laws. Yes, sir, I will. Thank you. I think you'll abide by all of the laws. So I truly yes, appreciate sir, you. I will. And, and congratulations, too. You know, that's a true testament, you know, after 40 years. You know, I don't want us to just, you know, let that be a side note of what you said. You know, you're going back to school and, and, and you know, what you're being this close to graduating. I, I don't know you, but I'm, but I'm so proud of you, seriously. And I mean that. And I want you to know that from the bottom of my heart. Well, thank you. It's a, it's a point of pride. If Absolutely. nothing else. Absolutely. And, and accomplishment. And accomplishment. So uh, congratulations. And, you know, you got my vote. So thank truly you. looking forward to supporting you. Thank you, sir. Representative Fritz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, sir, thank you for your willingness. And I'll just echo what my colleague said. Your leadership that you're demonstrating, not just for your family, your whole community, to go back and, and finish college this time, uh, we should all give that a hand. Uh, <laughs> And and uh, and I mean that. Um, is it an, is it your intent to help make our Tennessee universities the very best in the nation by promoting the constitutions of the United States and Tennessee for the benefit of all Tennesseans? Absolutely. Thank you, sir. Thank you. That completes our list of questions. Thank you, sir. Thank you for being up here. Please give our best to uh, the mayor. I will. When you go home and tell him to uh, come see us very much. Okay, members, that completes our consent calendar, the, those who have been before us. So we're back in session. We will now at this time, i got a motion and a second. Any objection to the question being called? All those in favor of moving the candidates forward on the consent calendar, please indicate by saying aye. aye. Those opposed say no. The ayes have it. It does move forward. Thank you all very much. Thank you for answering the questions. And, and uh, these go to calendar and rules. So thank you very much. Now, members, we're now back on, uh, let me make this clarification. Item number six on your consent calendar has been bumped. It's being taken off notice. That's HJR 105. Item number 10 on your consent calendar, HJR 110, has been bumped in roll one week. We are now back on item number five, HJR 101. This is for confirmation for the East Tennessee State University Board of Trustees, Dr. Lisa Piercy. Mm -hmm. Members, uh, I'd like to have a motion in a second as we begin. Second, thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Piercy, you, uh, Leader Cochran. I think you have requested to make the, the introduction on, on this, this member. So you are recognized. Is a Representative Brock Martin in? Okay. If he is, he can come up here and join Representative Cochran. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I may be uh, uh, pinch hitting th this afternoon for, for Representative Martin. So I appreciate you letting me, uh, thank you. Letting me join you. Honored to... Uh, to uh, introduce Dr. Piercy. So Dr. Lisa Piercy is the founder and CEO of Trostella Strategies and served on the Tennessee, Gov on Tennessee Governor Bill Lee's cabinet as the 14th Commissioner of Health. As chairman of the Governor's Pandemic Task Force, Dr. Piercy provided leadership throughout the COVID-19 response. Prior to her public service, Piercy spent over a decade as a senior level operations executive. She has served on numerous boards within the academic, agriculture, healthcare, and entrepreneur entrepreneurship sectors. After, honoring, after earning her bachelor's degree in chemistry from Lipscomb University, Piercy received her medical degree from ETSU's Quillen College of Medicine and an MBA from Bethel University. She is board certified in both general pediatrics and child abuse pediatrics and serves as clinical faculty at Vanderbilt University School and as adjunct faculty for the University of Tennessee Health Sciences Center. She and her husband, David, are West Tennessee natives and have four children. So I appreciate the opportunity to, to introduce Dr. Piercy. Thank you very much, Leader Cochran. Before I go to Ms. Piercy, I need to recognize Representative Ritchie. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, for this particular uh, item that we're addressing right now, I request a roll call vote whenever it's time for a decision. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. That is a proper motion, members. We will have a roll call vote. Uh, on this candidate at the end. Uh, Representative Pierce. Uh, parliamentary I mean, inquiry, Mr. Chair. We're now, we're, we're now out of session. And, uh, let, out of parliamentary inquiry. Okay, you are recognized. According to our House rules, it takes three members of a committee to a roll call vote. We had, we had the three. I had already double-checked. Yeah, well, can we know who the three are? Because this is according to our House rules. Okay. La Lafferty, Warner, Ritchie, 
Butler, Fritz, Reagan. Mm, yeah. Okay, we had that. Okay, that's all in proper motion. We have uh, Dr. Pierce, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, members of the committee. It's an honor to be before you today. I'm Lisa Piercy, and as mentioned, uh, I most recently served on the governor's cabinet as the commissioner of health for the Tennessee Department of Health, um, beginning at inauguration with Governor Lee in January of 19 and concluding my service this past June. So I've been out for about nine months now. Since then, I have transitioned into uh, private equity slash healthcare investment space, uh, and I'm enjoying being back in the private sector and being back uh, in my children's lives, quite frankly. So uh, I have a long history in my family with ETSU, but just in our nuclear family. That is where uh, I got my medical school degree and did my residency uh, in those initial years of training. I grew up in Gibson County, and so Johnson City was a really long way from Gibson County. And not long after I got there, I met another Gibson County boy in Johnson City and ended up marrying him. So I got my MD and residency there. My husband got both his undergraduate and his graduate degrees in Johnson City. We had all four of our children in Johnson City and absolutely adored our time there, our big fans of the Appalachian culture. We moved back home where I practiced at the Jackson Clinic and then uh, you've heard the rest of the bio. I'm particularly um, impressed with ETSU's focus on three things that are very important to me. One of those is um, their commitment to first-generation college students. My husband and I were both first-generation college students uh, and felt very supported and, uh, and, and encouraged there. Also, one of the things that yeah. has been a crux of my career is the focus on rural communities. Um, and ETSU not only advances the cause of rural communities, but rural students and those uh, with lower incomes and less, um, uh, less resources. And finally, personally, uh, their commitment to community-based healthcare and healthcare workforce is one that has served me both in my career uh, and now in my professional work. Uh, so I, it's an honor to be considered for this, and I kindly request your vote. Thank you, Dr. Piercy, very much. Now, we'll now entertain uh, any questions of the committee. We'll start with Representative Fritz. He has his hand up. Anyone else? No, Representative Fritz, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, ma'am, for your willingness to serve. Uh, same question you've heard many times. Uh, would it be your intent to help make our Tennessee universities the very best in the nation by promoting the... Uh, U.S. and Tennessee constitutions for the benefit of all Tennesseans. Emphatically, yes. Thank you, sir. Uh, Representative Parkinson, and then we go to Chairman Lafferty. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. I feel like I was just cheated just a second ago, but, <laughs> but that's okay. Dr. Piercy, do you, first of all, thank you for offering to serve. Um, um, will you abide by all of the rules and laws inside of Tennessee code annotated while you're in that position? Yes, sir. Will you abide by all of the rules and laws while you're out of that position? All of them. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. And I truly appreciate you willing to, being willing to serve. Thank you so much. Thank you. Chairman Lafferty. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for being here. Mm -hmm. um, through the years of campaigning and being out uh, in my community and talking to folks in the neighborhoods back home, uh, and, and everybody has seen the numbers declining as far as college attendance goes. What I've heard over the years, uh, one of the big reasons for that is the value proposition. They see what it costs, they weigh the outcome, and they decide, ah, this isn't for me. One of the other things, unfortunately, that I hear out there is a lot of folks are starting to feel dejected around a lot of these CRT and DEI issues. They feel like universities are no longer for them. Uh, they've been excluded by inclusion, as odd as that statement is. Um, are you familiar with uh, the CRT and the DEI yes, concepts? Sir, I, yes, sir. Okay. Um, how would you respond to the concerns that my folks have around such issues? Certainly, they are legitimate concerns, and not only at ETSU, but as you've heard, many of the higher education institutions today our number one goal is to make sure everyone feels like they're treated fairly, that they are welcomed, and that they are comfortable in sharing their views and therefore feel safe and supported on campus. And that also extends to 
students who come from lower income backgrounds, because you make a very uh, salient point about the affordability and the barriers, or at least perception of barriers that there could be from some of our underrepresented students. Uh, I've been duly impressed with ETSU's focus on making sure first gen uh, and low income students have equal opportunity to go to that university from an affordability standpoint. And regardless of one's ability to pay, we want everybody to feel welcome and heard. Follow up. Thank you, Chairman. Um, there's been actions in other states across the country to, like we did with CRT last year, to start to curtail the DEI because I think everybody is grateful for diversity. Uh, I am. It makes us all better, right. I believe. Uh, some of the other initials in there are where the issues get crossed, but some places are starting to use the principles of DEI to recruit students. Uh, as a doctor, is that something proper for someone going into, say, the medical field, since that is your background, or is it better that we have the best of the best uh, going into medicine? So it's a fair question, and I appreciate it. Um, I, I think all selection, whether we're talking about students or staff or anybody, needs to be based on merit. Now, having said that, it needs to be equal opportunity and everyone needs to be included in that process. Um, but I think regardless of what we're talking about, those um, factors need to be based on merit, not one's uh, innate characteristics. Thank you for your answer. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Any other, other members? Seeing none. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Uh, thank you for thank you, offering your time and for uh, working with the state all those years. You, you did during those tough years and everything. I appreciate it very much. So, members, we're back in session. We now have before us item. Questions been called. We're on item number five, HDR 101. A roll call vote has been requested on this candidate. So, would the clerk uh, please call the roll? Representative Baum? Representative Bolso? No. Representative Bolso votes no. Representative B Butler? No. Representative Butler votes no. Representative Sapicki? No. Representative Sapicki votes no. Representative Fritz? No. Representative Fritz votes no. Gant, uh, Representative Gant? Yes. Representative Gant votes aye. Representative Gillespie? Representative Haston? Yes. Representative Haston votes aye. Representative Hurt? No. Representative Hurt votes no. Representative Jones? No. No. Representative Jones votes no. Representative Lafferty? No. Representative Lafferty votes no. Representative Love? Yes. Representative Love votes aye. Representative McKenzie? Representative McKenzie votes aye. Representative Parkinson? Aye. Representative Parkinson votes aye. Representative Reagan? No. Representative Reagan votes no. Representative Ritchie? No. Representative Ritchie votes no. Representative Stevens? No. Representative Stevens votes no. Representative Warner? No. Representative Warner votes no. Vice Chairman Slater? Vice Chairman Slater votes no. Chairman White? Yes. Chairman White votes aye. Mr. Chairman, you have six ayes and 12 noes. Yeah, according to the roll call vote, the noes uh, carried the motion and the Candidate has failed to be approved. Thank you. Okay, members, thank you for that lively discussion as we go through uh, the calendar. We, we're running out of time, but we are going to try to get some. We have a couple of, uh, Representative Powers has some out-of-town guests that came in to speak on his bill. So, members, we are going to go to item number 15 on your calendar. Please, uh, House Bill 680. I need a motion. 
and second Representative powers you are recognized item number 15. uh okay. thank you mr chairman um house bill 680 is a release time education bill in 2015 this body passed a law that requires uh, local school boards of education to adopt a policy that excuses a student from school to attend a release time course in religious moral instruction for at least one class period during each school week. In 2019, this body passed a law that allowed the students of release time education to receive one half credit for satisfactorily completing the course. At that time, we asked for a full credit, but we compromised on a half credit because this body wanted to see if the release time education was successful. Now, four years later, we know that release time education in Tennessee is not only working, but attendance is growing. This bill will give more local control to LEAs. It raises the state imposed cap of a half a credit for a release time course. It lets LEAs evaluate a course and decide how much credit to award up to one credit per course. It puts Tennessee in line with other states that allow elective credit for release time courses, three of which have no state imposed limits on elective credit for a release time, but rather let school districts decide how much credit is appropriate. Tennessee students need five elective credits for graduation. This gives students more options to satisfy those graduation requirements. LEAs can still require release time courses to be academically rigorous and to be meeting for all similar amounts of time as other elective courses. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I would be glad to take any questions from the committee. Okay, members, uh, Representative Powers, you do have an out-of-town guest. So I'm, without objection, members, I'm going to uh, go out of session, and you may invite the, the guest. Uh, it is uh, Miss Stephanie Lloyd. You may come up. Yes. And if you will, make sure the mic's on, identify yourself, and then you may begin. Am I on? Hello. You're Hello, here. members. Um, my name is Stephanie Lloyd. I'm the program director at the Campbell County Christian Learning Center, which is a release time Bible education program servicing uh, Campbell County High School. And I am former, formerly the teacher there. Um, I'm a licensed Tennessee teacher. And um, I just want to thank you for considering this bill um, just to to remain on point of what this bill is addressing is simply um, the amount of credit that is allowed by the LEA to award um, that currently sits at um, a maximum of one half credit. Um, and we're just asking that uh, that would be increased to a full credit if the LEA um, deems it worthy of that academic merit. Um, all of this is outlined uh, in the secular criteria that they would look at to uh, determine whether it is academically rigorous enough. That would involve um, the amount of time in the classroom, the, um, the certification of the teacher instructing the course, an evaluation of the syllabus for um, academic standards and content, and the um, the, uh, excuse me, uh, the assessment, uh, that there's an assessment involved um, on an academic uh, standard approved by the LEA. So um, the LEA would still be at liberty to determine if it were not up to their criteria of academic standards, they would still be allowed to grant uh, less credit uh, or no credit. It would, it would be up to them to determine that. Thank you. Thank you, members. Any while we're out of session, anybody have a question, Miss Lloyd? Thank you so very much. Thank you. Appreciate it very much. We're back in session. Uh, Representative Powers, uh, I don't have anybody on the list. Anybody have a question for the representative? Chairman Lafferty? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just a quick one. I'm having flashbacks to high school. I needed half credit to graduate, and I only had one or two options. Uh, is this going to help kids that may find themselves in a situation where they're limited on options because it's just a half credit? Uh, you recognize. Well, uh, what we're going to do is hopefully uh, increase that to one credit. So you won't have end up having that half credit problem. Um, right now, the LEAs would still be allowed to deem it a half a credit, but we're just making limit up to one full credit. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Representative McKenzie. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, does the uh, local LEA have have any input on the um, uh, course material that that that, that this uh, outside entity provides? You're recognized. Yes, thank you. Uh, they have full control over the curriculum. They they look and they have to approve the curriculum for the course. Follow up. Thank you. So you know uh, this that that's a piece that kind of concerns me in that if if you know say another uh, non popular in, in the United States religion uh, chooses to try to introduce a course and, and some of these uh, some of the others other religions of man um, and there becomes a conflict there we might find ourselves in a lawsuit have you considered the the fact that this might be some non-christian let me be blunt some non-christian entities that that choose to to take part in this Representative Powers? Uh, yes. Uh, and and going back to uh, the lawsuit thing, you know, as we know, and we've got a lot of attorneys that are in the building here, uh, anybody can sue anybody over anything. So, uh, but this has been uh, approved by the Supreme Court, you know, back in, in 1952, Zorich versus Clausen was a Supreme Court ruling that allowed re release time courses. So it's completely up to the LEAs whether or not they wanted to approve any other type of religion or anything. It's completely up to the LEAs. Follow up. Yeah, and th th this is my last one. And, and uh, another concern that, that I have in, in in that as we're trying to 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 build our students up, we, we're trying to improve, you know, that basic reading, writing, and arithmetic, arithmetic the things that are core to K twelve education. That, that, that these things take away from that, albeit, you know, altruistic and good and maybe great in your community, but it may not, it, it might be a, a deterrent for uh, another student that we're really just trying to get across the finish line to be, you know, competent and able uh, to, to, to perform in either two year, four year of uh, the vocation, military, whatever that, that, that career may be. So I, I think this, this gets away from the direction and the trajectory that, that, that we're trying to push here in Tennessee. Resident Powers? Uh, well, they uh, thank you. And th they have other um, other courses, too. I mean, weightlifting, you can get a full credit for weightlifting, uh, for uh, home ec, for ROTC, for many other different uh, art courses, whatever. They all offer a full credit for them, too. So I don't think we're really taking, and I agree. I mean, I, I agree with the three R's that, that I was brought up with. Well, we have to teach that, but these are all elective courses, and they have to have five of them. So this is just one option for them. Thank you. Uh, Representative Sapicki, Chairman Sapicki. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just a couple quick questions for you. We've been fighting this battle for a while now. Yeah, long time. Yeah. So do we have, if this bill moves forward and you do get the one credit in the law, yeah. are we done on this? You recognize. I, I promise, and I want to go on record saying that I will not be back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> mm -hmm. How many years? Four years now? Uh, well, since 20, yeah, four years for the, yeah, yeah. To, to raise it to a half. Uh, eight years altogether, yeah. Yeah, four years on this bill. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Okay, members, any further questions? Or we're on item number 15, House Bill 680. Any objection? Any No more questions? Any objection to the question being called? Seeing none, all those in favor of moving House Bill 680 out to calendar rules indicate by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? No. The ayes have it. If you want to be registered as a no, please see the clerk. Members, we're now going to jump over all to right. item number. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Committee. And we're, I'm sorry, where did you say? Calendar, calendar rules. rules. Calendar right, thank rules. you. Yeah. Thank uh, you, committee. Members, I'm going to jump around a little bit. Uh, we're planning on, if everybody's going, we're, we've got the room until 3.30, so we're going to try to knock out as many bills as we can. To then, right now, we're going to jump over to item number four, House, because we have an out-of-town guest. Item number four, House Bill 595 by Representative Ritchie. Got a motion in a second. Representative Ritchie, I notice you have a couple amendments, and one rewrites the bill. Correct. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, I have one bill that rewrites and another one that uh, adds uh, clarification as well. Okay, so we go on with 5047. That rewrites the bill? Correct. 5047 rewrites the bill, and then we also need to attach 4126. Okay, members. 
I got a motion and a second on the amendment because it rewrites the bill. We'll go ahead and add that first before we have discussion on the bill. Then we'll come back to your second amendment. Okay. Uh, all those in favor of adding 5047 into House Bill 595, indicate by saying aye. aye. Opposed? Ayes have it. Okay, we're back when your bill is amended. You may describe the bill. Thank you, Chairman. So this bill as amended, uh, currently in TCA code, uh, there's a set procedure for being able to recall a school board member. However, under section E, which is what this, one of the components of this language will end up doing, it will remove subsection E, which was designed to only incorporate or be applicable to one county in the entire state, which is Madison County. Uh, so how we end up looking at this is if we've got a step in a procedural for being able to recall a school board member in one county, that should be applicable to every county. So in sub, one of the questions that came up was the number of signatures that it would take to be able to trigger a recall uh, ballot. And those petitions currently under TCA code, it is 66% for that member. So the example that I've been sharing with everybody is if me and two of the other colleagues here were running for a particular seat and combined we had 300 votes, but let's say that I won it with 101 votes, it would only take 66% of the 101 votes currently. So with this amendment in here, it takes and it says for that district seat. So if there's 300 total votes, it would take 66% of all the votes for that particular district seat to be able to trigger that recall ballot, which would then end up going out to the citizens. Citizens would end up coming in. Um, and then from a clarity standpoint, under section two, we put in there that it has to contain factual statement that clearly identifies the reason for the recall um, being sought. So with that, Chairman, I uh, stand for any questions. Members, that's the uh, gist of the bill. Any questions on the content of the bill before I recognize you? you are you, want, Representative? Uh, Richie, are you wanting to us to entertain your other amendment in a minute? Yeah, we need to go ahead and attach that because that's what I was describing. Okay, let, let's get through the meat of your bill first. Uh, Representative Parkson, you're recognized. I, I just got a quick question. Who who determines the uh, if the information is factual? So in the TCA code, it states that you, on the petition that's being circulated around, the reason for a recall being sought is there. And then from there, the local county election verifies the signatures is there. And then it goes on the ballot to be voted on based off of what that particular claim is. Follow up. Thank you. And thank you. You know, I'm just trying to get just a little bit more clarity on your bill. So and, and I'm not trying to I'm, I don't have a position on your bill yet. So I'm just trying, trying to understand it. Uh, so two things. I'm still not clear on who determines if, let's say, for instance, somebody says we want to recall board member Johnson because board member Johnson did not, um, he does not go to church like he says he did. And so who determines if that's a fact? Is the is the election commission, they, do they determine it or who based, determines if that's the truth? So based on current code on, on what's in there allow Madison County is that particular statement is written down and then it's submitted over to the election commission. Okay. And, and, and then, then my last question is when, when the recall election happens, is that factual information also part of the ballot measure in, included in the ballot measure or is it just their names on the ballot? It, it's just my understanding on that is their name on the ballot for being able to be recalled. And then it takes a two thirds uh, vote in the affirmative for that to have to take okay. place. Thank you, sir. Okay, further questions to the sponsor on the bill so far as properly amended with Amendment 5047. We can you withdraw? We've got one more amendment to entertain. So. Seeing all the questions on that, uh, Representative Richie, you have Amendment 4126. Motion on the amendment. You got a motion and a second on the amendment. You may now describe your amendment. Thank you, Chairman. So what all this amendment right here does is this changes the language in the current code to where it says for that member to for that district seat. That was one of the questions uh, that came up or concerns in subcommittee was the 
small benchmark of signatures needed. So now we're taking 66% of the total votes for that particular district seat is what this amendment is addressing. Questions on the amendment as described. Question on the amendment. Question be called. Seeing no objection. All those in favor of uh, adding amendment 4126 on to House Bill 595. Indicate by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. Now your bill is fully amended. We do have a, a, a guest speaker that requested to speak on this. So is there any objection going out of session, members, at this point, let our guest, Miss uh, Tricia, is it Lucente? You may come up, we're out of session, and you may have two minutes to uh, speak. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, my name is Tricia Lucente. I am a mother and resident of Williamson County. I am asking you to support this bill, allowing constituents to have a chance at recalling a school board member if we'd like to. When they fail to represent the best interests of our constituents, they are failing to act in the best interests of our children. In the last two years, we have witnessed some appalling behavior from school board members, nasty attacks on constituents on social media, at board meetings, and in national news publications. During a discussion about books that contain sexual assault and graphic rape scenes, we had our school board members say, Statistically, many people will, will experience sexual assault and books depicting rape will help readers cope and prepare for these situations. Another saying that these books help students experience these situations from the comfort of their own home without the trauma and develop empathy. Our school board members are openly abdicating, introducing violent assault and rape to children as young as 10 years old. How appalling to say the, how appalling to say the very least. When we were in the thick of the pandemic, we had a school board member say, your rights as a parent are gone when your child walks through those doors, and they are now our responsibility to make decisions for. We've had meeting requests ignored, we have been laughed at, we've been told our opinions as parents don't matter, and the list can go on. They do have a code of ethics, but it is self-governing. It was broken disturbingly in the last two years, yet there are no consequences in district policy, so it goes unaddressed. Even fellow board members have brought up the poor behavior, which fell on deaf ears. A four-year term is a long time to wait for our chance to change the people making choices for our children. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Members, does anybody have a question of our guest while we're out of session? Seeing none. Thank you so very much for Thank you. being here. We're back in session. We're now, any further questions of the Representative Ritchie on his bill as presented? Uh, we have, excuse me, for you, if you would take withdraw your question, Representative McKenzie. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, um, our question on the process: if a if a recall is put forward, um, who's eligible uh, to get to that sixty six percent? Are the only the folks that voted in that election eligible? to vote for the recall of that election? Or can any registered voter within that district vote? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So correct, it is 66% of the voters for that particular seat, that district. So they would not have had to have voted in that particular election that elected that member. They just have to live with inside of that district. Follow up. Uh, uh, thank you. And, and you know, in, in, in my home county, Knox County, uh, we, we actually, um, it takes 10 percent um, to recall a county commissioner, a uh, school board member. Um, so that were that form of government of, of governance. And that so that's that that's an advantage of that. But that to me is where uh, these issues should lie. That that should that, that should happen at, at a much lower level than the uh, uh, state. And that's actually going to harm the way uh, my charter form of government in, in my home county operates. So that's a concern uh, to, to, to me and my constituents. Uh, so uh, how would you respond to that? Uh, I would say that's almost like comparing apples and oranges because the 10% is for the number of voters that are there to be able to calculate how many votes it takes. So how that charter works there in Knox uh, County or Knoxville, like you mentioned, is it takes 10% hypothetical. There's 10,000 registered voters. It would take 10% of that. What this particular TCA code says is it's 66% of the votes that were received during that election. So there might have been 10,000 people that lived in that district. If only 200 people showed up to vote, 
it would only take 66 percent of the individuals that showed up to vote for that particular seat so it's uh different um as far as for how, how what we're looking at there you may follow up thank you and um I, i'll guess the, I'll, I'll ask this in, in two uh, parts is why are you bringing this bill before us and and two do, would this apply to state representatives state senators and things of that nature is that is that your overall intent thank you chairman uh so this bill was not brought brought to me by any organization i actually had uh several individuals that had concerns across the state in different school districts um, and they pointed out that there's a process in place to be able to recall school board members in Madison County, but that does not apply to any of the other counties. And in my opinion, it's similar to like the ESA stuff that we've got going on. If it's good for one county, it should be good for all 95 counties or we shouldn't be doing it at all. Um, so from that reason, that's why we decided to spread it out. And then what, I, I'm sorry, what was the second part of your question? Follow up. Uh, well, thank you. You know, uh, they're, 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 they're prohibitions oh. for us to be recalled. So it is, uh, where, where's, the, the, where's the, I guess, the, the, from a state legislator standpoint, for us to pass a law that, that doesn't really apply to us is, is, I would think, a bit hypocritical. Correct. So uh, th thank you, Chairman. So this bill only uh, addresses school board members. And like I mentioned in the school, in the subcommittee, I would be extremely happy to put something in place to be able to recall even myself. So uh, during the summer, I'd love to sit down with you, uh, Representative, and come up with some legislation where we could put in place to recall state legislators as well. Thank you. Okay, okay, members, we're on House Bill 595. Questions been called without objection. All those are moving House Bill 595 out to finance indicate by saying aye. aye. Opposed? Nay. The ayes have it, moves out to finance. Okay, members, we're going to jump back over on House Bill 1214, item number one, if you would permit us to take that one up next. Those members in the audience, Chairlady Moody, Halsey, Dixie, Hakeem, Harris, we're going to work diligently to get you all out, too, since you've been waiting patiently. So I am going to turn the gavel over to Vice Chair Slater, as I have this All right, committee members, we are on item number one, House Bill. Uh, Chairman White, you are recognized. Thank you, committee, and appreciate you letting me go ahead and carry this one. I am carrying this on behalf of our uh, of the leader's office, Speaker Sexton's office, so I kind of want to go ahead and move it or at least present it for that this bill is, is known as it deals with um, – let me just go ahead and start. Uh, parents across the state have become Chairman more White, aware. Chairman White, excuse me. Do you have yes. a, uh, a an amendment on this let's, bill? Let's that, make uh, sure we, it? we've got it here. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like it. it it's, it's been a, a long day. <laughs> it's been a long day. Let's see. The amendment we're working off is 4560. That is correct. Okay. Properly motioned. All those in favor of adding the amendment, say aye. aye. All those opposed, no. The amendment is on the bill. Okay, here we go. Okay, what this particular bill does, brought to me by Speaker Sexton, and the gist of it comes from this. Parents across the state have become more aware of the struggles in the education system, especially when it comes to our in-home population, the education uh, and safety of our most at-risk students. This legislation looks to give a give parents that fall under these categories an option to have a high quality education through a charter system for the homeschool population, as well as an option to create charter boarding schools that will provide a safe and rigorous academic experience to give our most at risk children an opportunity to become productive citizens. So this bill is really uh, divided into two parts. The first part is the creation of a hybrid charter system that offers a portion uh, to our parents of, of structured in-school learning. And it also creates a high-quality educational opportunity for, for this particular population. And here's the way it works. It's known as a hybrid charter system. 
for parents desi desiring stronger support, for parents providing in-home schooling, wanting support in an in-school structure. So the hybrid system works like this. Current homeschool law, parents it, it already in the law, for a parent to homeschool a child must have at least a high school diploma. Now that's not in this bill, that's already in, in the homeschool law. Item number two, the Charter Commission will be the authorizer and regulatory authority for these hybrids. Number three, must provide three or four days of in-school, in-classroom instruction with the remainder one or two days being offered by the parent, which is currently being done by the homeschool parent. Item four, parents provide the remainder of the week intervention or instruction. They must have 180 days of instruction. Uh, an enrollee may enroll in an out-of-district but there will be no lottery. If there's no room, there will be no, there will only be a wait list. Uh, the hybrid institutions may change tuition, uh, may charge tuition to out-of-state district students. And number eight, that they have to abide by all the state standards adopted by the State Board of Education. That's the first part of the bill, a, hy a hybrid system for uh, parents who are currently homeschooling their children, but, but want more structure to enroll their children in, in a hybrid system of charters where they would be in school three or four days a week and the rest of the week instructed by their parents. There's a second part to this bill that a that a states that a, a charter under this statute may operate a male and or female boarding school to ensure students in grades uh, or to serve students in grades six to 12. Spaces will be for Tennessee students who are considered mainly at risk. Now, by the definition of at risk, I mean, if they're homeless, foster, runaways, free and reduced lunch, economically disadvantaged, and that term, abuse, neglect, family dysfunction, disability, a lot of the things that our DCS has to deal with now, and it's open to any child in the above at risk category, but there are, of course, again, no lottery if the, if the school is full, it's only a wait list. They must operate on a year round basis, Boarding schools must operate under the state standards of a residential program. It is tuition free and it may apply to, and it may, they may either apply to the charter commission or to the local LEA uh, for, for a residential program. So we're really talking about two aspects. So the bill is designed to offer an instructured learning environment for those students who are currently being uh, schooled at home for parents who, who want a little bit more in school and more structure. And they will be, of course, tested in things as normal in state. And then the second part is to create the opportunity for a residential boarding school for those students that have either been expelled or at risk or have issues such as DCS is always looking for places where uh, the children at risk uh, could be housed. And that's really the gist of the bill. And with that, I will entertain any questions Thank you, sponsor, for that explanation. Um, Representative Parkinson, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair. How are you feeling? I'm feeling good. I, good, I, good. I'm glad that uh, Chairman White has been in good health uh, so far this year. I, he's he's number one on my prayer list. So right, right. So right. So. Well, well, he took the brunt of it for you today. So that's correct. Yeah, that's why he was so shaky when he got to the yeah. to the podium. Uh, and and thank you, Chairman, for 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 bringing the legislation. I'm 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 excited about the second part. Uh, just have some questions about the first part. The the funding with this hybrid model of, of charter school, I'm not sure if if homeschoolers receive funding, uh, or per pupil funding, and you know we're going to TISA, so I'm not sure how that works and how would that work with this with this new hybrid model? Yeah, Chairman White, they currently homeschoolers do not. Now, if they go back into, into the charter system, it's a state approved charter system, they would be under the TISA model for the, the time that they're at school. So they would then receive the, this charter school to re, would receive state funding. And follow up. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and is based on the amount of time they spend in that charter school, are they receive if they spend what is it? How many hours did you say? Uh, or four days? I think you said three well, or four either days. Either three or four days in school and one or two days in homeschooling. So would they receive the full amount of the funding or would they receive a proportionate amount of the funding based on the amount of time that they spend in their charter? Yeah, I wish you hadn't asked that. Um, I am not definite. That is one question I didn't ask as I was studying this. I would, 
I would think proportional, but I would need to get you an answer on that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I, I'd appreciate that. I, yeah, I need to, I need to hear that answer. I'll find out. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair. Follow up. I, I don't know if anybody's on the list. Is Department of Ed on the list by chance? No. That was intentional. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Sponsor. Chairman Sofiki, you're recognized. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, before we go any further, is anybody signed up to speak on this that could be from the governor's office or anything else? Nobody signed up to speak on this. You're on your own there, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. Um, Mr. Chairman. You're recognized. So <clears throat> one of the things that, that we try to be very careful with when we talk about homeschool is the homeschoolers want their autonomy. They want to be able to have their autonomy and freedom to educate their kids the way they see fit to do. Is there anything in this bill that would prohibit the homeschool um, community if they participate in this charter school from still being able to maintain their autonomy and freedom that they so cherish? Chairman, as I understand it, a home, it does not touch the homeschooler if they can desire to continue doing what they're doing. This is only for an option of those parents who may prefer a little structure where they would enroll just like any charter school or any public school. They would enroll their their, their child in the, that charter school and uh, because they want a little more structure to help them out uh, because schooling of a child is, is demanding. And so it's, it's an option. It's not a requirement. Chairman Sapicki. And, and follow up with the learning loss remediation that we've passed and all of the other the governor's bill about extending summer school and tutoring down to kindergarten. It hasn't, hasn't passed yet, but it's coming our way. Um, would those, would those uh, programs be available to these students to help them if they have learning loss? Right. They would be just like any other public school. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Representative McKenzie, you're recognized. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so in, in terms of, I'll, I'll ask both of these questions together. Uh, you know, we've, we've got legislation this year and most years dealing with, with the vaccine and vaccination, how we deal with that. Uh, and I know homeschoolers, I know there's a bill this year moving forward that they don't even have to turn their records into the LEA or, home, or, or, or charter school for that matter. Uh, if a parent chooses this hybrid model, I just want to make sure we're clear, will they have to be vaccinated and follow the rules of the LA, of the LEA or charter school? And then my, and my second question real quick is about testing. Uh, will, 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 will there be state testing for the, these hybrid students? Yeah. Answer to your question is anytime you have a public chartered school, this, now these will be under either the LEA and or the commission to, to approve. So they will be bound by all state standards and rec uh, rules and requirements that any other public school would be. Does that answer you? Thank you. All right. Any other questions for the sponsor? Uh, Chairman Reagan, you're recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And to the sponsor, uh, the boarding school portion of your bill, uh, as I understood what you described, that, that could be very helpful to a number of the the cities in our state, perhaps Memphis or Nashville, for uh, the population that would fit that. Is that going to be part and parcel of this? Is that correct? Yeah, they would be separate. Like if you apply for a charter to be a residential, then that would that's separate from the, just the, the first part, the hybrid charter school. So if you are a charter organization that wants to get into that business or you're in that business, then that's where you would apply it. So it would you'd be a kind of a different situation, which I think it would be a very advantageous for our state to have such opportunities for such uh, disadvantaged children. I agree with you, sir. Thank you. Any other questions for the sponsor? Representative Love, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and I know we've addressed the issue of funding when it comes to the hybrid public charter school. There's a boarding school portion that's also included in this bill, correct? The second part, yes. The funding for the boarding school, is that coming from the local education association or is that coming, agency rather, or is it coming from some other source? How would the boarding school tuition yeah. be paid for? As I understand it, 
through my studies of the bill so far, if it's a boarding school or residential program, it is tuition free and it's paid for by the public school dollars of the students who go there, the, the TISA model, whatnot. And so as long as they're in district, they're being paid the same dollars through the, the that you would get in any other public school student. Follow up. So there were any additional cost of the boarding school will not be the responsibility of the parents or will it be the responsibility of the district? As I understand, it it uh, will not be the response of the district. They can charge tuition, extra tuition to the uh, the parents of of the child, but not anymore on the uh, taxpayer. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Representative Ritchie, you recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Chairman White, for uh, bringing a piece of legislation that's uh, near and dear. So, for understanding on this. Uh, This hybrid model is for homeschool students there. It is still has to go through the regular charter approval process that's currently out there. This is just allowing a charter entity that would be able to be set up that would funnel almost like some of these umbrella uh, programs that are out there right now um, is what this would end up doing to allow some of the state dollars to be able to flow in there to offset those costs, correct? That is totally correct. Just like the charter schools operate now, they either had to go through their LEA and or our charter commission. And under this bill, they can go directly to the charter commission. I met with the charter commission to kind of get their input on this. Uh, and so once they're approved, they're either under the authorization of the local LEA or the charter commission. And they had to abide by all the same rules that any other charter in the state does. Thank you, Jeremy. Love it. That Thank was you. exactly what I was thinking. Thank you. Chairman Hurt, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, just kind of a couple of questions on the second part of this bill. Um, are we talking here housing students? I mean, I had somebody visit my office that touched on this, and they were talking about opportunities for, for students maybe in DCS. Or I mean, I'm, I'm really confused on what we're doing here and what the goal is. And, um, you know, I was there was something mentioned to me about housing and, and holding students, and then I'm thinking about fiscal notes on that. And, what kind of explain to me the, the second part of it, how that works and the type of students that it would serve. Right. So not to be any confusion, we got two parts of this bill. There's the hybrid charter for the uh, in schooling parents that want to take option of that. The bill would also establish another portion of a charter that would come into that could that could operate and it would be the, the school, the charter school, but it would it could actually do boarding of the students and the boarding now that would the the, the cost the, the, the total cost you know you've got you can charge tuition extra tuition for those students but but it's, it's excuse me you can charge extra to the parent but it is tuition free and so that will be the challenge going forward of, of the uh, charters that may want to apply to be able to do this in, in our state so that will all be worked out with the charter commission and things. So it, it is, that's a separate part of the bill. And the intent of it is, Representative Ritchie just said, is to offer an option for our at-risk students to have this particular facility uh, where they might be dropped out or uh, falling through the cracks. Follow up. Thanks for that L little help there. I, just, I know this, this bill has a lot of working parts to it and, um, a lot of head scratching from my point to understand how it all kind of works together to be here in the the full committee and, and not having any good grip on it um that that being said i understand that part i'm and i think you referred to it a little bit ago um students with that that the second part of this may serve um all types of students there with all kinds of needs um would would that charter school i'm guessing be continued students with disabilities would have ieps in this charter, I mean, in this second part of this charter school, I'm guessing they would have to abide by all state rules. And I think you referred to that a minute ago, but I wanted to specifically ask about students with the IEPs on that part of it. Chairman White. And I do apologize. I had two conversations. You said that, it, could you ask that last part again? Yeah, you're recognized. Yes, sir. I'm sorry. I should have paused for you. <laughs> um, 
I'm, I'm, you kind of referred to it earlier, but I, I wanted to touch on the, the second part of that bill with serving the types of students the second part of that bill will serve, and there will be all kinds of students with needs, um, especially students probably in that category of disabilities and the, the students' IEPs. I'm guessing that charter school would, across the board, have to abide by IEPs and accommodations and everything that those students would need. I just wanted to ask specifically on the IEPs for that one. Yeah, I, I would... I would imagine so. I mean, let's say once you set up a charter school, it's got to follow all the rules and regulations of any public school. A charter, you know, we all know what a char charter is. So what I like to do, if uh, if, if it's if I may, you have more questions, and I don't want to force a vote on anything. Even though we're we're moving this forward and we're out at the timeline, I would like to maybe ask that uh, if. And I didn't clear this as the speaker, but I would like to maybe we will roll this one week and make sure you feel comfortable before we put anyone up to a vote. All right, without object. Uh, okay. Oh. Point of order, are we, a, uh, are we not adjourned? We are not adjourned. We're not adjourned. No. Do I have a uh, motion to roll a week? All right, without objection, we will roll all bills that have not been heard to the next calendar. Hearing no objection, we are adjourned.